from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. The West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working to double the degrees produced annually in our state by 2025 through increased opportunities for West Virginians to earn the credentials today's economy demands. The High Technology Foundation, building a stronger West Virginia, online at wvhtf.org. At the legislature today, a bill to ban a commonly used abortion method is on its way to Governor Tomlin's desk after a vote of approval in the House. In the Senate, a vote kills a bill that would have allowed natural gas pipeline surveyors onto private property without permission. And do you support the GOP majority's legislative agenda this session or have their votes on social issues left you questioning the party? We discuss the latest survey of West Virginia voters coming up on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Ashton Mara. Governor Tomlin has signed a bill that ends a special severance tax committed to paying off the state's workers' compensation debt. Those special taxes were imposed on coal, natural gas, and timber 10 years ago. Under Senate Bill 419, the revenues collected from the tax will now be dedicated to closing a nearly $400 million gap in the 2016 general revenue budget. That budget year ends in June. Once the year ends, the special severance tax on coal and natural gas will expire, but the tax on timber will be reinstated. That money is used to help fund the division of natural resources. The bill was part of Governor Tomlin Tomlin's plan to backfill this year's budget while balancing the 2017 budget. Tomlin's office is predicting state tax collections will come in some $466 million below revenue estimates this year. Members of the House of Delegates passed a bill today that would ban a commonly used second trimester abortion technique, except in emergency situations. Liz McCormick brings us a look at the debate. Senate Bill 10 was on third reading Monday with pending amendments. This bill bans dilation and evacuation or D and E abortions, but allows those procedures to take place when there's a medical emergency. Some OBGYNs have testified before lawmakers that the bill takes away one of the safest options for women and interferes with the doctor patient relationship. Those in support of the bill say the D and D method is barbaric or medieval. There was one amendment offered on the floor Monday and it came from delegate Nancy Guthrie, a Democrat from Kanawha County. Her amendment would have added a provision to allow for an elective DND abortion if a woman was a victim of incest or rape if the rape is reported to a law enforcement agency. However, Delegate Patrick Lane, a Republican from Kanawha County, pointed out this provision was already covered in the bill and the amendment was rejected. The bill then moved on to the voting stage and many Democrats stood to share their opposition. There is no reasonable alternative to this that is available today. It just doesn't exist. In, when we questioned the alternatives to this in judiciary, we learned that one of the procedures that's being recommended isn't even being taught to med students. It is not something that OBGYNs have in their repertoire today. Each and every year, we get further and further away from allowing women to have safe, affordable, and rare reproductive health care. Now we've brought the doctors into it, and we're dictating to doctors how they are to practice medicine. In my opinion, this bill is unconstitutional. It violates women's liberty and privacy rights because this is a very, very private decision. 
about whether to have children or not. Most people really want to have children. And most people, it's a blessing to have children. But we should not be barging in to the doctor's office and mandating that decision. Republicans stood to speak in favor of the ban. If the mother's life is in danger, the physician is allowed to do whatever necessary to save the mother's life. There is no question about that in this bill. But Mr. Speaker, we are talking about a live, unborn baby being aborted by a mother who doesn't want it. Imagine the trauma on the baby and imagine the trauma the mother will feel from that day on knowing that she killed her own baby in such a barbaric fashion. Safe, legal, and rare. We've heard it over and over since 1973. We've heard it in this room today that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. Well, out of those three words, the only thing I can think abortion is, is legal. It's not rare, with more than 55 million unborn children being aborted since 1973, and it's not safe. The CDC says that more than four, in 2009, the CDC said that more than 400 women have died because of it, as a result of a d &E abortion. House Health Committee Chairman Joe Ellington also stood in favor of the bill. He referred to a bulletin sent by the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists to OBGYNs, referring to the guidelines they have to follow. Ellington is a member of ACOG and a practicing OBGYN. All this is saying is that if you have a live fetus, you're not going to dismember it. Now, this was brought up also about the term dismemberment. It's not a medical term. In the same bulletin, they they describe it as disarticulation for those of you that want to be specific. In any case, all this is saying is that you have to either terminate the fetus before you perform the abortion or you use another technique. And the same bulletin reports the different techniques on how you can terminate the fetus. So this, uh, this bill does not prevent someone from doing that. Certainly someone that is going to terminate the fetus is not going to be against injecting potassium chloride or digoxin into the fetus. So I don't see that this is a boundary that does give an, the medical exception as far as emergency that you can still do that. Um, I don't have a problem with it. Senate Bill 10 passed 86 to 13 with bipartisan support. Without amendments, the bill will soon be on Governor Tomlin's desk. For the legislature today, I'm Liz McCormick in the House. Over the weekend, a Senate committee made some changes to a bill that's inciting protests across the state. Members of the House approved the West Virginia Religious Freedom Restoration Act more than two weeks ago, but as approved by the Senate's Judiciary Committee, House Bill 4012 is now the West Virginia Religious Freedom Protection Act. The Judiciary Committee's chair says that's because the judicial test codified in the bill did not need to be restored in West Virginia. Senator Charles Trump says the four-step test already exists existed under case law in the state. The committee's version adds additional language to make it clear that the bill cannot be used to discriminate against any person or group. It also provides protections for churches and religious leaders who refuse to perform a service or ceremony or refuse to recognize a marriage that does not align with their faith. The amended version of the bill could see some floor amendments tomorrow in the chamber and will likely be up for a final vote Wednesday. Senators did vote on several bills today, including one that would allow pipeline surveyors onto private property without the landowner's permission. With projects like the Atlantic Coast and Mountain Valley pipelines being considered by a federal regulatory agency, the bill is a direct result of a lawsuit against one natural gas company in the state. By allowing surveyors onto private property without the landowner's permission, the West Virginia Senate was attempting to put a law in place saying the surveying of these projects is in the public's interest, almost like an eminent domain law. Eminent domain is a practice used by state and federal governments where a private land is purchased for public use, whether the owner agrees to it or not. Federal law says the practice can be used when building a pipeline. Charles Trump is the Senate's judiciary chair. As the members can imagine, and this involves uh, the balancing of, uh, because there is eminent domain authority for uh, natural gas pipelines under federal law, 
uh, balancing property rights against the need for the companies that are going to construct pipelines to be able to find the uh, best route forward. The bill would have required the gas companies to send a notice via certified mail asking permission to be on the property between 15 and 60 days prior to the survey date. The company would have also been required to file an application with a state or federal agency and be using the survey or study to meet regulatory requirements under that application. Senator Ron Miller from Greenbrier County says Senate Bill 596 is the direct result of a court order issued in his district dealing with the construction of the contentious Mountain Valley Pipeline. Natural gas company EQT is a partner in the project, which would stretch from Wetzel County into Virginia. Here's what we're doing with this, this bill. The judge, a, a circuit judge in, in Monroe County, issued an injunction to stop this happening. Now, that could have fought itself out in court, and it should fight itself out in the court, and I believe the Supreme Court may be looking at it at the moment. But instead of letting it fight itself out in court, instead of spending the money, those who have the money have decided it's better to come up here and simply make us give them what they want to circumvent what the court might do. And that's exactly what has taken place here. With this piece of legislation that we passed today, we're telling the court, we don't care how you rule on this. We don't care what the people want in this region. We're going to take your land because it's cheaper for us to come here and get a law passed than to let the court make the decision. That's wrong. I think we need to let the court run this thing through. Republican Senator Greg Boso says, do. though, the bill would have like allowed anybody. surveyors a method to even decide if a pipeline right-of-way is necessary on the private property in question. It's making an, an attempt to assess what is the route that needs to be taken. Many times that there, uh, when you get to looking on properties, there's environmental concerns and they can't go across those environmental concerns. Why? Because it runs into problems with the fish and wildlife folks. Uh, we get into wetland cons considerations, things of that nature when they're doing these surveys. You can't identify that unless you walk the route. Senators ultimately killed the bill, voting 23 to 11 against it. Republican Majority Leader Mitch Carmichael was the lead sponsor of the bill. He, Senate President Bill Cole, and nine other Republicans were the only votes cast in favor. Dave Seipolt is a Republican from Preston County. He was elected to represent the state's 14th Senatorial District in 2006. Senator Seipolt chairs the Senate Committee on Education. He also chaired the Legislative Oversight Commission on Education Accountability during the interim session. Amy Summers was elected to the House of Delegates in 2014. From Taylor County, she represents the House's 49th District as a Republican. Delegate Summers serves as the Vice Chair of the House Health Committee. A registered nurse, Summers was a volunteer paramedic for 19 years. Delegate Summers owns a farm and raises Angus cattle and chickens. The GOP majority in both chambers have received plenty of criticism and support this legislative session for taking on controversial issues like right to work and the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. West Virginians on either side of the issue have made their stances known through social media campaigns and rallies at the State House, and many opposed are turning those feelings into political fuel for the upcoming primary and general elections. Here this evening to discuss a recent poll attempting to measure West Virginians' thoughts on both major legislative issues and the 2016 political race is Curtis Wilkerson. He's with Orion Strategies, the firm that conducted the poll. Curtis, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So let's start with how this poll was conducted. What did you all do? Who were you asking? Sure. We looked at uh, a statewide poll. It's uh, 306 respondents, which gives us a plus or minus margin of error of 5.6 percent with a 95 percent confidence rate. The great part about this poll is that we broke it down just among historic likely voters. So these are people who will be showing up in this next election cycle and people who voted in the last couple of elections. Further, we broke it down by congressional district, so it was proportionate to each of the three congressional districts in West Virginia, and we sur surveyed all 55 counties, getting responses from at least 53 of them. 
There was also a breakdown of parties. You all said in your release that 50% were Democrats, yeah. 32, excuse me, 35% identified as Republicans, and 15% identified as Independents. A survey about 65 to 70 questions, so a big one. Yes, big, very, very large survey, and the partisan breakdown is reflective of the uh, voting trends that have been going on the last couple of election cycles. Okay, let's jump into some of the issues. Two right off the top. When I have members of the GOP majority here on the show, they tell me that overwhelmingly people support things like voter ID and drug testing for welfare. And you all asked West Virginia voters about those two things specifically. We did. And, and, and those two particular issues score in the high 70s. Um, respectfully, respectively, I believe it's uh, voter ID is at 77 percent or 76.6. And the implementation of mandatory drug testing for those people on, on TANF or other forms of government assistance is 70. 7.3. One of the things that we note is that often those who are, are in elected office find the issues that play very high um, and, and therefore know that they have somewhat of a slam dunk issue as they move forward. So just to be clear, about three, three fourths of West Virginians suppo support excuse me, both of these issues. Okay. Let's jump into the tobacco tax because that's something we've been hearing a lot about, states having budget issues. Yeah. And so they've approved a bill that um, would increase the tobacco tax by one dollar. And your poll says that West Virginians support that. Yeah, so and it's something that was a little bit of a surprise to us we found. So we had 59% of historic likely voters were okay with raising the tobacco tax to begin with. And of those people who support it, we asked them, okay, do you want to bump the 45 cents that was introduced uh, by the governor? Or to go up to a dollar that was being floated by the legislature. And what we found is that 52% of those who supported the tax were willing to do a dollar or more, and it was only 34% at 45 cents. Now, there is a partisan or a gender breakdown there. We find that women have an 11 point um, gap that want to support more, a dollar or more above 45 cents, but men at a 55 to 30% would rather support a dollar or more. So you get a 25 point spread there. So there's one bill that has been approved in the Senate, not taken up in the House just yet, and that's a brunch bill to allow the sale of alcohol on Sunday mornings starting at 10 a.m. What did you all find? Not a lot of support for that one. Uh, much to the, uh, the, the, the chagrin of everyone who loves a mimosa or a Bloody Mary, 38% uh, of West Virginians are okay with that. And, and further, we found out that the, the, the point spread uh, on gender is, is significant. Although we, there are still more men who are against it than, than, uh, than are for it, it's a 51 to 44, but among women, it's 58 to 32. I want to get in quickly to the governor's race because polling says justice is ahead by 24% in the Democratic primary. We know that Bill Cole obviously doesn't have any opposition in the uh, Republican race. So Cole up 24%, but 45% undecided at this point. Yeah, it, it's, it's a pretty significant amount of undecides. We find this across all of the races in which we were looking at for the 2016 election. Of course, it's still early. It's a snapshot in time. Those things can change as things move on. But first of all, we have uh, a lot of undecides, both in the Democratic primary and for the November election as a whole. And I think that the uh, candidates will have uh, a lot of real estate that they can uh, move forward within in order to pick up votes as they, as they campaign through both May and into November. We only have about 30 seconds left, but I want to mention the legislature as a whole is polling at a 31 percent approval rating. How does this compare historically? Oh, it's it's pretty low. <laughs> and also West Virginia on the right track, wrong track, only 18% of West Virginians think that it's on the right track. That's the lowest that we've seen in the last 10 years uh, since Orion's been making that question on a regular basis. Uh, we release this type of polling every six to 12 months and, and by far and away that's by definitely the lowest we've seen. Curtis Wilkerson with Orion Strategies. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Two West Virginia groups combined efforts today at the State House to show their support and opposition to bills they say will affect minority groups in the state. Rob Engel reports. On Civil Rights Day at the Capitol, local members of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and the Hope Community Development Corporation met to persuade lawmakers to advance legislation that benefits the minority community. Specifically, the groups are concerned about the fate of Senate Bill 649. It would create a minority economic development advisory team to address the economic problems facing underserved minority populations in West Virginia. The bill remains in the Senate Government Organization Committee after being introduced last week 
week and is facing a final deadline for passage by Wednesday, the last day for senators to approve bills that originated in their chamber. The groups were also seeking to halt the passage of three bills, House Bill 4240 relating to the Uniform Controlled Substance Act, House Bill 4576 increasing penalties for transporting controlled substances, and House Bill 4578 creating a criminal offense of conspiracy to violate drug laws. Reverend Matthew J. Watts with the NAACP says while he understands the intentions of these bills, the end result will be higher incarceration rates for minorities. And it's going to not only cause a growth in our prison population, drain money away from education, job training, substance abuse type programs, and just fill up our prisons that are already overcrowded. So those are, there are three bills that, that are closely connected together, and they're kind of going under the radar screen. No one is paying much attention to those bills. The NAACP has trying to bring those, uh, those bills to light so people will pay a little bit more attention to them. All three bills are on second reading in the House today and up for a vote Tuesday. For the legislature today, I'm Rob Engel at the Capitol. Politics are on full display at the West Virginia State House during the legislative session, but those lawmakers are also writing the state's history on a daily basis. A number of people are employed at the Capitol to record that history, including two we'll meet tonight, the West Virginia legislative photographers. Hi, I'm Martin Vallon. And I'm Perry Bennett. And we're the legislative photographers for the West Virginia Legislature. My job here is to essentially document the proceedings of the legislature and to make the delegates and, uh, and the, the lawmakers look good. Um, uh, you know, most of all, they need to be good, clear shots uh, and just documenting the day's proceedings, you know, kind of whatever that entails. First and foremost, we're, we're trying to capture the action of the Senate or the House capture the, the intensity of, of passing a bill or making a statement or reading a petition or anything like that. With my background in uh, drawing and painting, I'm not so much a uh, technical photographer, so to speak, although that's super important. I like to focus on the composition, shooting you know, through things, shooting through other delegates. I've been known to shoot through people's arms and they're leaning on their arms, shoot through their arms try to frame things in an interesting manner uh, and make it interesting for, um, for the public to engage uh, with what the legislature is doing. Every session is special to me. Every session just brings something different. Every session has probably a handful of photographs that just stand out. I've been into photography ever since I can remember, uh, ever since I was a kid. I saw it on TV as a kid, just really enjoyed it and uh, just never stopped. I'm originally from Slovakia, I moved here in 1997, went to WVU, and um, I was fortunate to get an internship with the Legislative Information Center, and that's where I've been ever since. I'm actually from Atlanta, Georgia. I spent uh, 32, 32 years in Atlanta, and my love of motorsports photography brought me to West Virginia in a roundabout way, Martin Vallant builds and races cars and we met each other through the SECA matter of fact Sports Car Club of America and so Martin contacted me to be the per diem photographer for the house that year in 2014. I quit my job of seven and a half years in Atlanta and moved up here kind of on a dream. We have a wonderful team in our office and uh, I think Perry has been the one addition that is just huge between his experience in photography and even motorsports. He's very fast, he's very good at what he does. He's been an inspiration. When shooting motorsports, you have to be very aware of your surroundings. You know, at any time, a car could come careening off the course, you know, towards you or whatever. You have to be quick on your feet, uh, and you have to just be, be aware. I can be on one side of the, of the chamber, something's happening on the other. Being aware of where to step, where to be, and where to be to get the, the, the shot you're looking for just like in motorsports. And this is where laws are made, this is where things happen. And being here to capture that and being uh, tasked with capturing that is, uh, is truly an honor. And uh, I'm so blessed to be able to, to do that every day. I'm proud to be here and I consider myself now being from here, essentially. And I uh, really enjoyed every moment being in West Virginia and being here at the legislature. I will treasure that for the rest of my life. 
The countdown is on to crossover day at the State House, the final day members of the House and Senate can vote on bills that originated in their own chamber. The deadline is Wednesday. Tomorrow on our show, we'll speak with the minority leaders of both chambers. Senator Jeff Kessler and Delegate Tim Miley will share their thoughts on the pieces of legislation they'll be watching as lawmakers approach this important deadline. This has been the Legislature Today. I'm Ashton Mara. Thanks for joining us. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. The West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working to double the degrees produced annually in our state by 2025 through increased opportunities for West Virginians to earn the credentials today's economy demands. The High Technology Foundation, building a stronger West Virginia, online at wvhtf.org. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.